Sleep well, Russia's enemies. Putin to Russia's enemies, incoming. By Dmitry Orlov. Published, February 21, 2023. A good way to determine whether you are still alive is by asking whether you can still feel wonder and amazement at watching the changes sweeping the world. Most such changes are gradual and hard to detect as part of your day-to-day -day experience, and so it is useful when someone important stands in front of you for an hour, as Putin did today before Russia's Federal Assembly, and explains exactly what has happened and exactly what is going to happen. It is also quite entertaining, Putin is someone who is naturally irrepressible and refuses to hold back. His Russian also has a tremendous dynamic range, one moment he sounds like a streetwise kid from the tough streets of Leningrad, and another moment he sounds like a lawyer and a consummate technocrat, literary scholar or even a theology student. Well, he is all of these things. Like him or hate him, few people manage to feel neutral about him, but he is difficult to ignore. Especially since, as is usual, his annual address to the Federal Assembly was not lacking in what linguists call performatives, statements that do not express opinion or impart information but actually transform reality in specific ways. And these it is important to know about, especially if you reside in one of the countries whose leaders have, very stupidly, decided to be Russia's enemies, since, ultimately, it is your ass that's on the line. You may stand in awe of the awesome leader, whose name is Vladimir Putin, there is nothing to stop you, but, more to the point, I feel it is my humanitarian duty to warn you what's likely to happen before someone shouts incoming. That way, you might formulate a better plan than just covering yourself with a white sheet and slowly crawling toward the cemetery, so as to not cause a stampede in which someone might get trampled. And so. Let's start from the most momentous, Putin announced that Russia is suspending its participation in the START III treaty. That's treaty between the United States of America, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics on the Reduction and Limitation of Strategic Offensive Arms, Number 3. This treaty dates back to the Soviet era, but on February 3, 2021, the US and Russia agreed to extend it until February 5, 2026. Putin stipulated the terms under which Russia would consider returning to the treaty, it must take into account the strategic offensive capabilities of all NATO countries, not just the US. Britain and France also have nuclear weapons, although none of them are too fresh, and Washington has a tendency to send its nukes to any place it likes, including other NATO countries, such as Germany and Turkey, and this is a problem. Putin ridiculed NATO's calls for Russia to allow its experts to inspect Russian military sites, after recent drone aircraft carried out a strike on Russian airports that host its strategic aviation, damaging a few planes, using the Ukrainians as mindless proxies, such a request is beyond ridiculous. Perhaps Russia should be allowed, as a courtesy, to blow up a bunch of US strategic bombers, just to even the score before commencing negotiations. No. Oh, well. Putin also pointed out that US strategic weapons are well beyond their sell-by date, he was a bit more polite and circumspect, but that was the gist, and those who are in the know also know that he was being factual. Figuratively speaking, when it comes to nukes, Washington's armory is in sad shape, the cans are bulging, and the ones that have burst smell really bad and are leaking vile substances. More specifically, there are some technical details that can be grasped without having to become a nuclear weapons nerd. The US has zero, that's right, zero, factories that can build nuclear weapons. There is some artisanal activity going on at a handful of laboratories, Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, Sandia, and maybe Savannah River. But what they are doing is rather sad, trying to manipulate plutonium in glove boxes. And we know that plutonium, what the US uses to make bombs, goes bad over time, it accumulates isotopes that make a bomb go off during assembly or to not go off at all and just make a big mess, and there is no known way to separate plutonium isotopes. The complete lack of nuclear weapons factories means that the US has no way to make fresh new plutonium. Also, 
We know that the US has never developed the ability to enrich uranium to weapons grade, the only other option for making nuclear things that go bang, so that its stale old plutonium is all it has to play with. To satisfy the uranium enrichment needs for its large number of elderly nuclear power plants, it no longer seems to know how to build new ones, the US relies on Russia's state-owned nuclear monopolist Rosatom, sanctions. What sanctions? And, to a lesser extent, on the French, who are also reliant on Rosatom. So much for the US, as far as the rest of NATO, the British rely on the US for its Trident II ballistic missiles, and the French haven't tested a nuclear weapon since 1996. But the US not only plans to maintain its bombs but also has plans to develop new ones. Given its many limitations and the boutique nature of its nuclear weapons effort at the national labs, these would be mini-nukes. The Russians know all about these plans and it makes some of them laugh, remembering a joke about a certain patented American flea powder. To use it, you catch a flea, tell it jokes to make it laugh so that it opens its mouth, and sprinkle the powder in its mouth. Moving on, if you have some nuclear bombs, as Americans do, or think they do, even though most of them are decades old and probably have some mutant mice nesting inside them, the plutonium is there to keep them warm, then you have to have some weapons delivery systems. To wit, the US has some 400 Minuteman 3 missiles, and after a string of unsuccessful tests, it actually tested one successfully, although how successfully we will never know. Said missile was selected at random, sure, sure, transported to a facility, prepared for the test, all guts replaced, to be sure, and fired in a random direction, or at least there was a track in the sky shown on news footage. Whether it actually hit anything we don't know, there was no footage of men in uniform, armed with tape measures, measuring the distance between the bomb craters, supposedly, three of them, to the specified target. In any case, these are ballistic missiles, which means that once the boost phase is over they follow a ballistic trajectory that can be computed based on their initial path. This makes ballistic missiles easy to intercept. There is also some number of submarine-launched Trident II missiles, shared with the British, they are cagey about the number of them that's still deployable, and these are also ballistic missiles. Lastly, there are strategic bombers and cruise missiles. Most of the cruise missiles are Tomahawks, which fly at a positively pokey 550 miles per hour, a Boeing 777 full of fat tourists can do better, and based on their use in Syria they are unreliable, a bunch of them fell in the sea, and easy to intercept even using relatively ancient Soviet-era air defense systems, never mind the new Russian ones. Most of the strategic bombers are ancient B-52s that also do no better than 500 miles per hour and a handful of B-1B Lancers that are supersonic but are about to be retired. Now let's compare that to Russia's strategic defenses. Today Putin stated flatly that Russia's strategic forces are now 93% new. Other branches are quickly catching up. I will not bore you with all of the technical details but the basic conclusion is that the US doesn't have anything that the Russians can't intercept while Russia has all sorts of things that the Americans have no ability to intercept whatsoever. What this means is that, in a nuclear confrontation initiated by the US, the Russians will fight off most of the attack. A few nukes might actually land in outlying regions, whether because they go off course or because the target was simply too remote to care about and even fewer of these nukes would go off as designed, the rest making either small holes in the ground or a nuclear hot mess. And then, in response, Russia would hold the US at its mercy. The opposite scenario, of Russia, launching a first strike, would be contrary to Russian nuclear doctrine. But then there was Putin's reading of the riot act, the West has covered itself in shame that it will never succeed in washing off. Its use of the Minsk Accords to mislead the world about its peaceful intentions all the while rearming the Ukrainian military for the attack was the height of hypocrisy. It coddled and encouraged Nazis and terrorists, refusing to acknowledge explicit, exhibitionistic acts of genocide, and not just in former Ukraine, just as it had done with Nazi Germany in the 1930s. 
The unnecessary wars it launched all over the world so far this century have resulted in 38 million refugees, and, I might add, an even greater number of dispossessed and internally displaced persons. What's more, Western leaders are proud of their perfidy and deceitfulness, thinking that this makes them so clever. They have never grown out of their racist, colonialist legacy, still dividing the world into supposedly civilized and democratic nations and the rest. It is they who ignited the hot war in the former Ukraine, arming the Ukrainians, then goading them on to attack the Donbass, and Russia intervened and is using force specifically to stop the war. Putin laid out the case of why this is a just war against the West, which Russia is going to win. To that end, Putin said something that Russia's Estonian neighbors might consider important, although Estonia's current crop of truly idiotic leaders, headed up by Karja Kallas, a world-class imbecile, are unlikely to appreciate it. Recently, NATO saw it fit to install him as multiple launch rocket systems inside Estonia. These rockets have a maximum range of 300 kilometers, whereas St. Petersburg, Russia's second largest city, is within 200 kilometers of the Estonian border. Now, what Putin said is this, the longer the range of their weapons, the farther away we will move their borders. Estonians, would you please make a choice, either get rid of those HIMARS launchers or GTFO? There is a third choice, of course, die in situ, but, seeing as you have been warned, that would be a spectacularly stupid choice. Speaking of stupid, while these European matters were discussed, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov had trouble keeping his eyes open. This is understandable from two perspectives. First, Lavrov had recently returned from two consecutive whirlwind tours of Africa, to help organize the next Russia-Africa summit to be held in Sochi in July. Based on the results of his visit, Africa is solidly in the Russian camp. The Africans have had enough of European colonialism, post-colonialism, and neo-colonialism, and they do remember that it was the USSR that helped them win their national independence. Lavrov was followed, a few steps behind, by representatives of the European Union, who were trying to contain the damage. Second, the Europeans are no longer an interesting subject for Lavrov the diplomat, simply because the West has left no room for diplomacy. Defense Secretary Sergei Shoig, on the other hand, listened attentively. The conclusion to draw from this is obvious, diplomacy with the West is finished, from now on, it's all about war. They made it themselves, and now they get to wear it. Hence this popular t-shirt, he who doesn't want to speak with Lavrov will speak with Shoig. And below are direct quotes from each one. Lavrov, fucking idiots. Shoig, we'll stick it wherever we want to. Alas, that moment has finally come. Speaking of stupid some more, there is really nobody in the West for either Lavrov or Shoig to talk to. What's happened to the collective West is some bizarre case of the collective Peter principle, people in a hierarchy tend to rise to their level of respective incompetence. Except that all the Western leaders you care to look at have exceeded their level of respective incompetence by a huge amount. Look at the excellent cadaver-in-chief, Emperor Dementius Optimus Maximus. He isn't fit to lead a shuffleboard tournament at a retirement community, too senile. And although you might think that he is surrounded by super sharp, top-notch people, they are even worse than him, for having agreed to serve under a demented puppet. This is particularly clear with VP Kamala Harris, her level of competence was as an exotic escort, how far has she exceeded that station in life? The rest of the White House, from the perpetually wincing Blinken to the mophead press secretary, is very much at her level. Looking farther afield, we have Mr. Rickshaw, the new British PM, unelected like the rest. He looks like he might be a gypsy, can he juggle? dance and sing at the same time. That might be his level of competence, and ingratiating himself with his white masters. Make sure to recount the cutlery at 10 Downing Street once he departs. And what about the European Union head Ursula von der Leyen? Her level of competence was in birthing lots of children. 
she exceeded it, first by becoming a gynecologist, talk about getting carried away with it, and then, by leaps and bounds, in her current job. Or take Josep Borrell, the high representative for something or other, certainly not diplomacy, for he is the rudest bastard that ever drew oxygen. His level of competence would be as an usher at a bordello. And then there is a proliferation of fancy ladies bimbos, the aforementioned idiot Kaja Kallas of soon-to-be-deserted Estonia is neatly paralleled across the Gulf of Finland by the equally talented Sanna Marin of goofy sex parties. She is much too thick to understand that without trade with Russia Finland, doesn't have an economy at all, never had, never will. When idiots tell her to join NATO, breaking Finland's peace treaty with Russia, and automatically returning it to a state of war with it, she says, may I have another glass of that wine, please. To finish off the list, there is Olaf Scholz, his level of competence is in organizing very large, kinky orgies. Now, who in this lot is there for Shoig, never mind Lavrov, to talk to? They would just throw cream pies at him, then slip, fall, and expire in a puddle of their own vomit. And so I'll guess they'll just have to wait for Shoig to stick it wherever he wants to. Other parts of Putin's speech dealt with internal Russian matters. The Russian economy shrank by a whopping 2.1% year to year because of Western sanctions, but that was all in the first quarter, after that, it quickly recovered. Inflation jumped to over 11%, again, all in the first quarter, and then came down to 0% and, and has not budged since. The ruble is stable and hasn't really moved at all since before the start of the special operation. Russia does not need to borrow from abroad and does not need to print money, everything the government needs as far as finances are available via the domestic market economy. Energy exports play an ever smaller role in Russian finances and have been reoriented away from the West. Excess natural gas production is being redirected to serve the needs of rural customers who currently heat with wood or with coal. Minimum individual income will be boosted by 18% by the start of next year. Public transportation upgrades are set to accelerate. Import replacement of IT products and services will be 150% tax deductible while IT entrepreneurs are already taxed at 3% instead of 20% and are exempt from military service. Russian companies are doing extremely well because the hurried exit of Western companies from the Russian market has opened up lots of new market niches for them to expand into. And so on, and so forth. Basically, the Western plan to destroy the Russian economy and hurt the Russian people in order to inspire them to overthrow their government was beyond ridiculous. If there is one element in Putin's speech that to me seemed just a tiny bit insincere, it was Putin's claim that Russia did everything possible to resolve the conflict in former Ukraine, through diplomacy while the West used diplomacy strictly as a smokescreen to rearm the Ukrainian army. Russia, too, used diplomacy as a smokescreen to lay the ground for the miracle that unfolded over the course of the past year, in spite of Western sanctions from hell and the need to swiftly rework the financial system, and the trade relationships, ramp up weapons production, revamp the military recruitment system, and carry out a huge amount of intricate diplomacy to make sure that the entire world, minus the West, stay on good terms with it, Russia has succeeded and is winning. As to how Russia will advance toward victory, here is an exact quote, step by step, carefully and consistently. Sleep well, Russia's enemies. This podcast was brought to you by BG Media. Download the BG Media app today or visit barglobal.net for more podcasts. Mm-hmm.